Crispin says, try Crispix. Crispix doesn't get soggy in milk. Hey, I love the guy, but nobody's perfect. Okay, it starts off crispy. Now, this spoonful is still crispy, but it's gonna turn soggy. Don't make a little mistake. Kellogg's Crispix cereal. Delicious corn and rice that stays crispy to the end. Last bite, it's gonna be soggy. Hey, it's still crispy. He's perfect so far. where you can really get away without having to really get away right here in Alabama call us right now for your free Alabama vacation guide it's packed full of fun and excitement at very affordable prices and see why America's best vacation values are right here in Alabama. His sanctuary is Notre Dame, the lonely bell ringer. He proved that strength of character transcends beauty. Why can't one be judged for what's in here? And now the story of Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame will also charm millions in a new animated film. Quasimodo, the story of one man with a larger-than-life soul. The Hunchback of Notre Dame on an all-new biography. Monday at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific on a and &E. From a and &E, this is Biography. From a and &E Studios in New York with Jack Perkins. On the surface, he was handsome, charming, intelligent, aiming to be a lawyer on the surface. But inside the man, there was a desire, even a compulsion, to murder people, to murder women. And so today, Ted Bundy is remembered not for going through college with honors and preparing for law school, but as a homicidal maniac who admitted to killing dozens of women across the country. Tonight, biography takes a journey into the mind of a killer, serial murderer Ted Bundy. It is further ordered that on such scheduled date that you be put to death by a current of electricity sufficient to cause your immediate death, and such current of electricity shall continue to pass through your body until you are dead. Theodore Robert Bundy considered himself to be a predator. He preyed on young women. He murdered at least 30 of them. He told me, he said, I decided to take a shortcut to be powerful and well-known and to be, to make my mark on the world. He thought of himself as a master criminal. He studied police procedures and delighted in the plans he made to elude detection. Bundy had a morality of murder about it. He felt that it was okay to kill. Clinically speaking, he's sexual sadist, serial murderer. The interesting question is, how could he do so many different things to so many different people and be pretty convincing at it? On January 24, 1989, nine years after he had been sentenced to die, Bundy was strapped to the electric chair at Florida State Prison. At 16 minutes past 7 in the morning, 2,000 volts passed through his body from a metal cap that had been placed on his head to an electrode secured to his leg. Theodore Bundy was executed at 7.16 a.m. in the electric chair at Florida State Prison. The official cause of Bundy's death is homicide, punishment in kind for the brutal rape and murder of Kimberly Leach, a 12-year-old schoolgirl. She had been the last of his many murders. 
The crowd cheered when Bundy's hearse rolled past. The man whose criminal career gave birth to the term serial killer was finally dead. In the days before he died, Ted Bundy had finally admitted he was a killer. Even as he was led to the electric chair, he carried with him the secrets of dozens, something perhaps more than 200 murders. For the record, you are guilty of killing many women and girls. Yes, sir. Yes, that's true. The magnitude of his acts, I, I just don't know. And were he still alive, uh, probably still wouldn't know. That's the manipulator that he was. I mean, he would string it along forever. <laughs> um, the funny thing happened to me on the way to labor law class one morning. I got two weeks in the spa on the third floor up here. When he seemed an unlikely killer, his image was that of an all-American boy. He had been a law student and a rising star in Washington State's Republican Party. I think things are going to work out. That's about all I can say. He was a fun person to talk to. He, he was interesting. Um, he was uh, charming. Uh, he was intellectual. He could be very sociable and very down to earth in how he related to you. He was also a man who had told police, I'm the most cold-blooded son of a bitch you'll ever meet. Never, not until a desperate, doomed attempt to save his own life, did he express any remorse. I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the most extreme punishment society has, and I deserve, I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me, that's for sure. Over the previous three days, Bundy had confessed to 30 murders. Many of his victims had never been found. Throughout the West, Police had been struggling for nearly 15 years to find those women and to determine if Ted Bundy was nearby on the day they were last seen. As they had searched for clues, they had also tried to unlock the secret of the evil that possessed him. Their unlikely partner in that quest was Ted Bundy himself. He's the one that told me that he was the only Ph.D. in serial murder there is. And he had read every single piece of literature every, ever written about killers, about serial killing. So he was the most knowledgeable. She was victims were not women in the sense that we think of them. They were victims, they were objects, they were the objects upon which he took out in a unique fashion the, uh, the inner turmoil that he felt. Speaking in the third person, Bundy speculated in interviews about the motives and techniques of serial killing. I think it'd be foolish to say that this individual felt no guilt or remorse at, at all for the actual harm he had done. It was just, you know, the extinguishment of a life. But it was that, that kind of guilt remorse was, you know, so minimal that it did not affect him, you know, in the long term. Ted Bundy can be a wake-up call to the fact that these people exist and they exist among us. And that it is not my belief that he went totally undetected. And that there were things very early on that appear to be significantly wrong uh, in his normal development. He was born Theodore Cowell on November 17, 1946. His mother, Louise, was 22. Ted would never know the identity of his father. He was born in a home for unwed mothers, and he was left there for three months by his mother, and then she returned and picked him up and brought him back to spend the next three or four years with um, his grandparents his grandfather, Sam, had a violent temper. One of the stories about him was that he was able to 
uh, pick up a cat and swing it by its tail and fling it against the wall. And witnessing that as a child would be significant in later behavior. In 1951, Louisa's uncle brought her and her young son to Washington State. She soon met and married a man from her Methodist church, Johnny Bundy, a hospital cook. Together, he and Louise would have four more children. Ted came to believe that Johnny was his father. They called him Theodore Bundy. He grew up in Tacoma, a port and working town at the foot of Washington's Puget Sound. He attended public schools and was known as an intelligent, if somewhat awkward, boy. I first met Ted Bundy in junior high school. He stood out as far as this intelligence. You know, he'd help me study on difficult subjects. I don't remember him as being an extremely social type of person. Uh, I think if he had friends, he had a few select friends. When he hit high school, from age 14, 15, and 16, he stopped developing emotionally. He hit a, a brick wall, is one way Ted put it. And so as he, as he progressed socially and intellectually fine up until that age, he then watched everybody else moving beyond him. At some age around puberty, Ted found out that, in fact, Johnny was not his father, that um, his father was unknown. Well, at that point, you're, as a male, are forming a lot of your identity, especially your sexual identity. That may have been the clincher for the antisocial behavior. Bundy and his family always contended that Ted was a normal child. Well, Ted, from my experience of his family, came from a very secretive family. And uh, in his words, he came from a healthy Christian family. And what that says to me is that Ted very possibly was sacrificed to this appearance in that as long as he looked good, then he was accepted in the family. He was very lonely, and he would go through people's trash and look for interesting things. And the thing that interested him most at first were detective novels and detective magazines. And he read them very carefully and he began to fantasize living out these stories. He started prowling his neighborhood at night, looking in windows at women, fantasizing about what he would do to them. The magazines that drove his fantasies focused on violence, angry men, frightened women. A man with a predisposition, as he describes it, getting angry and angrier, more and more frustrated, and turning to sex and violence, in a, in a, a fusion of sex and violence, looking for an outlet for all this hatred and all this fear that is building up in him. No one knows when Ted Bundy crossed the line between thought and action. The situation that you write for is like a revelation. And there's an unvarnished, unsophisticated, uncomplicated, unplanned desire to inflict a in 1974, ten years after Ted Bundy graduated from high school, police were troubled by a disturbing mystery. Young women were disappearing without a trace. Biography will continue in a moment here on a and &E. Would you please pass the jelly? <gasps> Poana all fruit is sweetened only with fruit juice for that all fruit taste. Jams and preserves as sugar and corn syrup and taste sugary sweet. We don't call it all fruit for nothing. So please don't dare call it jelly. 
for one or all food? For that all food too. Honey. I work in the education department at the Oakland Zoo, and that doesn't leave me much time for cooking. But if you get this message, put the lasagna in. I think Stover's quality is much better. My kids just love Stover's lasagna. It tastes like it's made with fresh ingredients. Stover's tastes like home cooking. The stuffed cream peppers taste like somebody just made them. You're waiting on me? It's food that you cook yourself if you had more time. The Oldsmobile 88 has been receiving quite a few awards lately. From J.D. Power & Associates for Best Premium Mid-Size Car and Initial Quality. And from Consumer's Digest as a Best Buy. So to celebrate for a limited time, you can lease the 88 for just $2.99 a month and no money down. Which means when it comes to great value, the 88 is the real prize. free design is a sure sign of intelligent life. A&D celebrates American Week with biographies of those who fought for freedom, events that gave us our independence, landmarks that have brought our past to life, and traditions that make us proud. American Week, beginning June 30th, only on A&E. Our biography of Ted Bundy continues here on A&E. On the last day of January 1974, Linda Healy vanished from her bed in a house she shared with four other students in Seattle's University District. Police found blood on her sheets and nightgown, but no other hint of what had happened to her. Six weeks later, Donna Manson disappeared as she walked across the campus of Evergreen State College near Olympia, Washington. She had told friends she was going to a concert, but she never arrived. A month after that, roommates reported Susan Rancourt missing from Central State College in Ellensburg, Washington. Several female students told investigators that a man with his arm in a sling had asked them to help carry his books to his car. The mysterious disappearance of these girls, the obvious concern about whatever happened to them, uh, was really very dramatic news. Um, and it was a vexing mystery. Three weeks later, Kathy Parks disappeared from Oregon State University in Corvallis, more than 250 miles south of Seattle. A um, girl leaves her dormitory to cross the campus to go to the library and uh, never arrives and is simply gone. On June 12th, George Ann Hawkins was walking the hundred yards between her boyfriend's fraternity and the Kappa Alpha Theta house. She never reaches her sorority. The rather instantaneous way that the girl disappeared heightened the mystery and the fascination with, with these cases. Brenda Ball was last seen on June 1st at a tavern south of Seattle. At first, there was nothing to indicate a common thread among the disappearances. No witnesses, no bodies. There's still no bodies anywhere, so you're really connecting the information from missing person cases. Police are kind of infamous about not investigating missing person cases, but these were surprisingly pretty well investigated. There was no break in the case until two women vanished from Lake Sammamish State Park on a warm, sunny day in mid-July, 1974. At about noon, a young man with his arm in a sling asked Janice Ott to help him load a sailboat on the roof of his car. He introduced himself as Ted. Ott was last seen walking her bicycle toward his Volkswagen in the parking lot. 
At about three that same day, Denise Nasland was approached by the same young man. Together, they threaded their way through the summer crowd toward the parking lot. She, too, vanished. King County Police launched their investigation after Denise Nasland and Janice Ott vanished from Lake Sammamish State Park. At least seven people at the crowded beach saw and heard a man who called himself Ted, and police were flooded with calls from citizens who said they had seen the suspect. I think there were five potential victims who had come forward. From those five, we got the basic physical description, the first name Ted, the brown-colored Volkswagen, which turned out to be tan eventually. Ted Bundy answered that description, but so did hundreds of others. Of all of them, Ted Bundy seemed the most unlikely. I really made no connection at all. There was some resemblance between the drawings that were in the paper, and there was obviously this reference to a person named Ted. But um, I personally made no connection with that at all. Ted Bundy was the image of a bright young man on his way up. He had pursued his college degree in fits and starts, but he had graduated from the University of Washington with honors in psychology. By 1973, he had gotten an important job with the state Republican Party. He was the coordinator for congressional and statewide campaigns for the state party. He was very, uh, very persuasive, very organized, uh, and generally was, was a nice guy. He was a good person to work with. He had a steady girlfriend, and she was convinced that eventually they would marry. His colleagues and superiors liked him and admired his talent. Everybody felt that Ted had a future um, that was, you know, maybe someday run for political office or do something that was creative in the business world. But Bundy's charm concealed a secret life. He was drinking heavily. His prized possessions were often things he had stolen. He only became the suave man about town, Ted, after he started putting together his fake personality, what we call his mask of sanity. He found a way of projecting his head that he knew was unreal, but was a head that everybody found very attractive. Down on the very center of the man, there was something desperately missing. There was a hollowness, an uncertainty about himself and in the very core of his being. And so the emptiness inside Ted Bundy filled with rage and hatred for the kind of young man he pretended to be. Men to whom success and women came naturally. This is the kind of individual who thought this was his friend George Ann Hawkins. And we know that this kid George Ann was last seen and we've seen any number of reports and she stopped off this fraternity house and see her boyfriend and was waving, shouting at them that she was last seen. So, and for the sake of argument, this person may well have thought that by depriving those individuals of something they desired and sought after in that fashion that, that he was in, in fact obtaining some kind of revenge. He would feel that he heard a voice. Now again, he would never admit that he heard voices because he knew that was insane. But he would describe someone as, an, as another Ted, that this other Ted would start talking to him in this growling voice and point out women as they walk by and said, that woman thinks you could never have her, you know, look at her walking by, what is she thinking about you? And work him up into this hatred where then he would start his procedure of, of stalking and usually drinking and waiting for an appropriate victim. Ever since this happened, I have been convinced that there can be two people in one body. The Ted that we knew offered no indication that he was a murderer or anything like that. We were shocked and uh, totally taken aback by this. In September 1974, Ted Bundy moved to Salt Lake City to attend law school at the University of Utah. That same month, a hunter walking in the woods near Washington's Interstate 90 stumbled across the desiccated body of Denise Nasland and some bones that are identified as the remains of Janice Ott. 
The site is only a mile from Lake Sammamish State Park. It was the first time police knew for sure that they were looking for a killer. The next March, a forestry student happened upon a human skull on a mountain 20 miles east of Seattle. A search turned up four more, the remains of Linda Healy, Susan Rancourt, Kathy Parks, and Brenda Ball. Finally, investigators knew the girls were dead and that their disappearances were linked. But they had only a sketch to go on. They found no physical evidence at all. And the face the sketch depicted was in a law school classroom 700 miles away. Biography will continue in a moment here on A&E. Look, it's the world's first on-battery tester from Energizer. You just press the dots to make sure your battery will keep going and going. Uh, a battery like this deserves to be in the spotlight, preferably alone. He doesn't wait for an invitation. He doesn't respect your boundaries. He's not leaving. The Intruder, the best novel I've read in years, says James Patterson. Unput Downable, says Stephen King. Peter Blauner's The Intruder. You'll never walk down the city street in the same innocent way. Now the man I retained one year ago to recommend this corporation's property, casualty, and group health insurance company. Here with his findings, the most sought-after efficiency expert in business, Mr. Fred Fox. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Fox. For all your business insurance, one word says it all. Tomorrow on Biography, Journey into Madness, we continue with madman Charles Manson, the Boston Strangler on Thursday, and Lizzie Borden on Friday. He's killed for unknown reasons. Through the FBI's database of death, Trace the movements of an international manhunt for a killer who, unless he's caught, will surely kill again. A Stranger Murder on Crime Science. Thursday at 10 Eastern, 11 Pacific, only on A&E. Before GMC introduced the new U.S. Olympic Gold Edition Jimmy, it had to excel in several events, like the freestyle, the floor exercise, cycling, and yes, even yachting. Judge one for yourself. The new U.S. Olympic Gold Edition Jimmy by GMC. Putting you comfortably in command. Do you dream in color? Hot pink, perhaps. Blue. of Ted Bundy continues here on A&E. Serial murder, contrary to what many people think, is one of the easiest crimes to commit and to get away with. The reason for it is that you're dealing, in Ted's case certainly, with strangers. Most killings are still done between friends and family. They are not, they are not done by strangers. So if you, are, if you are even medium good at it, and Ted was quite good at it, you can get away with serial killing for a great long while without any problems with tension. Soon after Bundy moved to Utah, young women there started to disappear. Nancy Wilcox, 16, from Salt Lake. Melissa Smith, 17, from Midvale. Laura Amy, 17, from Orem. Debbie Kent, 17, from Bountiful. It was at times bizarre to sit there with Ted when he would start discussing one of these killings. They keep trying to interject, well, but what would a, what would a, a human with a conscience do here? And it's an inappropriate question, because it's Ted, Ted the shark talking, and what sharks care about their victims except to eat them. He could indulge himself in his real-life fantasy. and may have even been experimenting having sexual relations with her. See, tied her up put her away where he couldn't see her until that time when that malignant 
portion of his personality was revived and maybe the man looked upon his own mind as a sort of controlled experiment in a way, uh, prolonging this kind of contact to, to see if that would have would bring about the kind of a satisfaction of the film that he, that he craved. He did him to his car, pull out the tire iron, crash him in the head put the handcuffs on him, put him in the car, get him subdued totally under his control. Then he would later on get him out to an area where he could further strike him in the head with the tire and strangle him. And then after that, he's in, you know, he doesn't describe what he did, but he's doing something with those people after death. In 1975, women began disappearing in Colorado. Karen Campbell, 23, abducted from an Aspen ski lodge in January. Julie Cunningham, 26, missing from Vail in March. Denise Oliverson, 25, last seen in Grand Junction in April. He led us to understand that what he really wanted to do, the, the object of what he was doing, was to possess a lifeless human being. He wanted, as he said, to own a girl the way you own a Porsche or a potted plant. And Ted was a very likable guy. Very likable guy. And I think that's probably why he was, it, was so easy, it was so easy for him to kidnap these women. Because he was attractive, he was a nice guy, very friendly, good gift of gab. And I'm sure that he talked many of those girls right into the car. In August 1975, a Utah patrolman pulled Ted Bundy over for running a stop sign. When he found handcuffs, a crowbar, a nylon mask, and an ice pick in the car, he thought Bundy might be a burglar and arrested him. In Salt Lake City, investigators were working on a kidnapping case. 19-year-old Carol Durange had been lured into a Volkswagen at a mall by a man posing as a policeman. Her kidnapper had tried to club her with a tire iron and handcuff her. Durant escaped. Utah police began to suspect that they were dealing not with a thief, but with a killer. Although Bundy tried to change his appearance, Carol Durant picked him out of a lineup. But I remember being in the newsroom of the Seattle Times that day that an AP story came across. It said a young man from Seattle named Theodore Bundy had been arrested and charged with attempted abduction of a young lady in Utah. And suddenly, everything exploded in terms of speculation. Robin, what's the latest on the story? Well, Steve, at the moment, there is no known connection between Ted Bundy and the women found murdered in Washington. But police are bearing down again in their investigation into the Ted murder cases in Washington State. Brian, I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. I've never been in jail before. I've never been arrested before. So. Bundy posted bail and was released. My personal plans are simply to uh, continue to live uh, the last the lifestyle as I can under the circumstances, to continue to uh, try to keep up on my law studies, although I'm currently not enrolled in law school. I'm going to do my best to uh, keep in touch with friends and family who've been so kind and been so good in writing and praying for me and uh, all those people contributed so much money in my behalf. They appealed to all of us for help and uh, there was, uh, at first we raised money and tried to offer legal assistance and so forth and all his friends pitched in like anybody would to pitch in for a friend. The trial hinged on Carol Durant. At first she had hesitated. Now she was sure. Ted Bundy, she said, was the man who attacked her. Bundy was found guilty. His sentence was one to 15 years. Most likely he'd be free in 18 months. But the evidence linking Bundy to the slayings in Utah, Colorado, and Washington continued to mount, and Bundy would not or could not provide an alibi. On more than one occasion, I think, Ted, uh, I'd love dearly to prove the cops wrong. Give me a time and place that would put you in another location on the date of a missing a girl, a girl's disappearance. But he just didn't respond to that kind of inquiry. The investigators worked furiously. 
Bundy would be eligible for parole in just 18 months, and police were convinced that if he got out, he would kill again. In October 1976, Colorado charged Bundy with the murder of Karen Campbell. He was extradited to Aspen to stand trial. But Bundy had other plans. Bundy jumped out of this second story window at the front of a Pitkin County courthouse this morning. Witnesses say he left in a hurry, however, nobody saw him open the window, and he escaped clean in an unknown direction. Bundy fled to Aspen Mountain, but he got lost. After several days, he was back in Aspen. Police picked him up in a stolen Cadillac. Next, Bundy, acting as his own lawyer, asked for a change of venue. The judge moved the trial to Colorado Springs, whose conservative juries had put many people on death row. Bundy was set to be moved in January of 1978. On New Year's Eve, he escaped through a hole in the ceiling. I have no idea where he is. I think he's probably still in the area of his history as anything, uh, you know, bears us out. People should be very careful, should check on their neighbors, make sure their cars are secure. Again, the man suspected of being one of the most prolific killers in history was on the loose. Biography will continue in a moment here on A&E. It's mine. It's all mine. <laughs> what? This is impossible. How can we do this? Stop. Stop. Every day, MasterCard opens over 3,000 new acceptance locations worldwide. Oh, at least we still have Cochabamba. No! MasterCard, it's smart money. Geography's Journey into Madness Week continues in a moment here on A&E. One, zero, liftoff. We have a liftoff. The greatest adventure which man has ever embarked. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The time has come to share a common bond. History lives in all of us. Uganda, why Travel through time with the History Channel, where memories of heartache and glory live on. As we enter the next millennium, the demand for history grows. The taking and the holding of hostages is unprecedented in human history. Original documentaries, special movie presentations, and great events. We'll take you there only on the History Channel, where the past comes alive. I've seen the promised land. Call your cable operator and ask them to carry the History Channel. After his escape from prison on New Year's Eve 1977, he would elude police one last time. And before he was caught thousands of miles away in Florida, he would kill at least three more times. One week after his escape, while lawmen searched frantically for him in the West, Ted Bundy arrived in Tallahassee, Florida, 1,500 miles from Aspen. Bundy blended in easily in the college town. If you look at his FBI picture up here, or any of the FBI pictures they had of him around the country, in each and every picture, he sort of looked like a different person. Ted was very adaptable. Whatever it had to be, Ted was it, and he, he was good at that. Bundy had come to believe that he had conquered his urge to kill. 
After Bundy's arrival, two young women in Florida State's Chi Omega sorority house were raped, bludgeoned, sodomized, and left dying. The murderer bit one victim viciously. He savagely beat two other members of the sleeping house with an oak club. The same night, a young dancer a few blocks away was attacked as well. Got these girls that are in their rooms and they're asleep and this person comes in and, and, and does these things. It really jarred the community. Plus the fear. And people were not sure that it wouldn't happen again. Two weeks later, 12-year-old Kimberly Leach disappeared from her school in Lake City. Five days after that, in Pensacola, Bundy, by then on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, was stopped in a stolen Volkswagen. He quickly became a suspect in the Chi Omega killings. Police found Kim Leach's body under an abandoned hog shed near the Suwannee River. Her killer had raped her and slit her throat. Joe Alloy was in the jail cell with Bundy when he heard the news. We handled telling Ted they found the bike. That's one of the times he went off on me. And he, and he really scared me. I'm not a scary guy. And he scared me a lot. He got real weird. His body changed, his muscle tone changed. He was sweaty. He was smelly. It was, a, it was a, an eerie presence. In July, Bundy was formally charged with three murders. He was going to get me. He said he was going to get me. Okay, you've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. Let's read it. Let's go. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged. Two counts murder in the first degree. Three counts attempted murder in the first degree. My chance is not suppressed. Contrary to section 78204, Florida statute. I'll plead not guilty right now. The Chi Omega murder trial became a media sensation. There had to be 200 journalists running around that courthouse. It just was just out of control. You couldn't go to the bathroom without somebody coming in there with you to ask you a question. As in Colorado, Bundy took control of his own case. The result was legal chaos. He wanted to cross-examine people. He wanted to uh, participate in the jury selection. He wanted to make open arguments. He wanted to do closing arguments. He wanted to do the whole thing. The first victim you saw was Kathy Kleiner. Did you speak there? Bundy's cross-examination of the police officers who witnessed the Chi Omega crime scene was a tactical disaster. Everything that prosecution brings into cases to shock a jury, we tried to keep that out or limit it as much as possible. Uh, the side of the face was like it had been uh, with a uh, crush, uh, sharp words. So the efforts of two days of trial are trying to eliminate testimony about the graphic nature of the offense. He elicited himself. Is that man in Portland today? Yes, he is. Would you point him out for us, please? An eyewitness, Nita Neary, testified that she saw Bundy in the hallway of Chi Omega on the night of the murders. Forensic dentist Richard Suveron testified that Bundy's teeth matched the bite marks the killer left on Lisa Levy's body. They made the mark. And the havoc Bundy wrought in the courtroom alienated both judge and jury and crippled his defense. We were highly motivated and we worked very hard and we were not able to do our job because of our client. On hand during the trial were Louise Bundy and Carol Boone, a former co-worker from Washington. Through years of correspondence while Ted was jailed, Carol's affection had deepened into romance. Carol believed from the very beginning that he was innocent. And she's very intelligent, and she could go to the court 
and understand the complex forensics that were used in convicting him and learn enough about it to find out that there were problems with him that could account for why he could be innocent. Give him the same amount of murder that he gave Lisa Lee and Margaret Thornton, which was absolutely none. My Christian upbringing tells me that to take another's life under any circumstances is wrong. And I don't believe the state of Florida is above uh, the love of God. Bundy was found guilty and sentenced to death. You're a bright young man. If you met a good lawyer, I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but if you went another way, partner, take care of yourself. Five months later, Ted Bundy was tried for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. This time, he was subdued. He was almost a non-participant in the second trial. He had no interest in that case at all. It was the sort of crime that even by Ted's really perverse standards was difficult to own up to. May the jury find the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy, guilty of murder in the first degree as charged in as the jury began to weigh imposing the death penalty, the Ted Bundy story took another strange twist. Bundy called Carol to the stand as a character witness, and while she was there, they exchanged marriage vows and became legally man and wife. Will you marry me? And I do hereby marry you. Thank you. Will you marry me? Within days, the new groom was back on death row now facing a third death sentence. For more information about exciting A&E programming, contact us at our website. Pedigree Little Champions is perfect for my little champions. They like how it tastes and they're thriving on it. Dr. Christine Dresser, veterinarian and top breeder of champion pugs. Small dogs deserve special food. Digestibility is very important. Pedigree Little Champions comes in a wide variety of flavors, and all the beef in Little Champions has gone through the USDA inspection process. The proteins contained are high quality, and they're the building blocks for good nutrition. They like good food, just like their mom does. Pedigree, developed with vets, recommended by top breeders. Well, Doc, it all started about a year or so ago. I started hearing these voices everywhere I went. One dime, and it's good forever. Good idea. Sometimes I hear the strange counting. One minute, two minutes, one minute, two minutes. Well, I can't go anywhere without the voices. Doc, in all your years, does it remind you of anything? Doc? Doc? Actually, it kind of it reminds me that I want to call Sprint for that dime rate myself. Boy. Sprint says, call now for 10 cents a minute. Before GMC introduced the new U.S. Olympic Gold Edition Jimmy, it had to excel in several events, like the freestyle, the floor exercise, cycling, and yes, even yachting. Judge one for yourself, the new U.S. Olympic Gold Edition Jimmy by GMC, putting you comfortably in command. impossible to escape because every day that we choose to consume instead of save we let something slip away investing is not just about stocks or bonds or annuities it's about freedom a serial rapist is on the loose and a cop is his next victim i have been raped we're going to get this one. But are there two men to blame? I want to do a play by somebody else. A fellow cop becomes the accused. Detective Sergeant Back, right me, sir. I'm telling you, I had him right on the point of confessing. Bobby Coltrane stars in the role that won him a Cable Ace Award. Cracker on the A&D Mystery Movie. Next on A&D. Our biography of Ted Bundy continues here on A&D. After Florida sentenced him to die in the electric chair, Ted Bundy's career as a killer was over. His remaining years would be spent protesting his innocence 
appealing his convictions and reading, talking, and thinking about murder. Bundy even offered to help investigator Bob Keppel track a Seattle serial murderer known as the Green River Killer. I think essentially he was trying to find out more about himself through others. He was searching them out for answers as to how they got to be the way they did. Hopefully to find some answer about himself. Bundy constructed a life for himself on death row. In 1982, Carol Boone Bundy bore his child. Bundy's wife and daughter visited him weekly. He corresponded frequently with those on the outside. Public pressure to execute Ted Bundy remained high. Lawyer Polly Nelson based some of Bundy's appeals on the issue of whether he had been mentally competent during his trials. The only defense Ted ever had was a form of insanity defense. People ask me if Ted was insane. And I always find that such a strange question because the definition of insanity doesn't include killing 35 strangers for no apparent reason. I don't know what it is. Obviously, he was insane. But Ted was uh, very prideful and was not about to admit that he was out of control. Bundy refused to cooperate with the insanity defense. When it seemed as though all of his appeals were lost, Bundy revealed his strategy for delaying his execution. Ted started talking about confessing his crimes in exchange for a certain amount of years to live from the governor. So I went down to see Ted and I told him that if he was even thinking of confessing to anyone else, he was going to have to confess to me first. He started telling me about where he was driving around in Idaho and came across a hitchhiker he took her into the woods. He strangled her. It was like he was in a trance. Every tiny detail of that experience was important to him. And for the first time, I realized that those very arms in front of me had done this act. In January 1989, the governor signed Bundy's death warrant. This time, it seemed there would be no more appeals. Bundy asked to see investigators from six states, including Washington's Bob Keppel. He wasn't going to talk about anybody that had, had been found. He wanted to talk just about missing girls with the idea that the police and the families of the missing girls would intervene on his behalf to convince the governor of Florida not to execute him. For the first time, Bundy admitted he was a killer. His first confession was to the murder of George Ann Hawkins. Uh, I was moving up the alley, moving from Cuthie. And I was in the alley and I was Bundy confessed to murdering 30 women in six states. Many, like Nancy Wilcox, had simply vanished. For years after that, uh, um, on her birthdays, I, I hoped to maybe get a phone call. I hoped to maybe get a phone call from her at Christmas time, uh, maybe my birthday, and, um, and I would wait. I would wait on those occasions. And, uh, when they didn't ever come, I, I had to resolve it. I can't believe that this has happened to our family. Nancy Wilcox was never found. Neither were many of Bundy's other victims. For Ted Bundy, there was not enough time left to recount all his murders 
before his own death. I'm not asking for clarity. I'm not asking to get off. I'm not asking for sympathy. But I, I draw the line. I, we need a period of time, systematically going over it with everybody. They're going to get me sooner or later. You don't need to worry about that. But you've been after this for 15 years. A couple months is not going to make any difference. That's what I have to say. The night before his execution, Bundy was allowed a last interview. He selected Reverend James Dobson, an anti-pornography activist. But I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question. I saw Ted the night before the execution. His wife wasn't there, his mother wasn't there, no family member was there. And I found that extremely sad. He felt very sorry for himself at the core, that he had a life that turned out so badly, but no sense of responsibility for what he'd done. There was truly no remorse. There is no measure of the cost of Bundy's crimes. He murdered young women whose lives were filled with promise, and he took to his own grave the secret of how many young lives he took, and ultimately why he did it. A lot of people know who he is by name recognition alone, and in some ways that's what he was trying to achieve, some sense of who he was. I think he killed for it. We were involved in a conversation about how a person theoretically could do these types of crimes. And Ted kind of without prompting said, gentlemen, there is no explanation. That was it. There are still investigations in many unsolved murder cases across those states that Ted Bundy left a trail of victims. He confessed to killing at least 30 women, but authorities believe the real number could be closer to 100. Now that he's dead, we'll never know. Tomorrow night, biography looks at a man whose homicidal passions led to one of this century's most infamous crimes. Charles Manson seduced his so-called family members into a two-night killing spree in the summer of 69 that left seven people dead in the city of L.A. gripped by fear. The madman behind those murders, Charles Manson, tomorrow night on Biography here on a and &E. I'm Jack Perkins. Now you can own a video cassette of this program. Call 1-800-423-1212 and you will receive the program you've just seen for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call 1-800-423-1212. personalities of today and yesterday. Explore the vast selection of book titles at your Barnes & Noble bookstore, the book lover's second home. And during the month of June, all biography videos at your nearest Barnes & Noble are 20% off. If you look no further than our crystal clear Caribbean waters, colors of our islands.
the past two years the old